My name is Paul Schumacher. I'm a research director of the Mech Center and the founder and chairman of Decision Strategies International. I think there are numerous examples because most successes were at one point viewed as failures. Uh, the famous example is, of course, three M's, you know, sticky notes, post-it notes, uh, viewed to be a failure. In medicine, we see a lot of examples. Um, there is an estimate that half of all drugs in, on the market uh, were discovered through by accident. They were accidental discoveries. Um, Viagra being one well-known case was started for, you know, to deal with blood flow around the heart. And then side effects were observed and the rest, as they say, is history. But it, that's the most famous one, but there's numerous such examples. Penicillin is probably the, most, the best example of where mis mistakes led to discovery of penicillin because Alexander Fleming uh, kept the window open in his lab. Uh, this was a long time ago before the Second World War. And um, he, his di Petri dishes got contaminated and he went on a long holiday and spores came through the window and he noticed their antibiotic properties. But even he thought it was a failure because at that point he, uh, he gave up on it. He recognized the properties. He didn't think you could purify penicillin to a point where you could give it to patients. And then some other researchers came, figured out the chemical structure of this uh, compound, this antibiotic, and it took 15 years between the discovery, the insight that these antibiotic properties existed, uh, and uh, application in humans. So in medicine you see a very long, and that's the, uh, the oddity is that as the founder of Honda once said, 99% of success is failure. Uh, success is really the end result of many failures, false turns. So I would say it's the norm, not so much the exception. Any product I think that's out there has had detours, whether it's computers, whether it's cars, uh, it is serendipity. Um, flying, you know, the Wright brothers made many false turns before they got airplanes up in the air. So I think this is actually the norm. And it's an unfortunate thing that we call all these things failures. Why are all the necessary steps that precede success, why give it such a negative connotation. I think a much better term, which I want comedian once used, is to say don't call them failures, call them time-released successes. Mm -hmm. There's temporary setbacks and they will eventually, many will eventually bear fruit. Yeah, so the question of what leaders and organizations ought to do to get more benefits from failures is number one, to recognize that failures are portals of discovery. So you have a failure, so a setback, things don't go as you had hoped. So you've paid the price in a sense. So, so rather than push it under the rug and blame it on other people or pretend it never happened, why not milk it for all it's worth? So every setback has a silver lining. And the silver lining is that the fact that the setback happened means that something surprising happened, that your views or expectations were not quite on target. Now you can beat yourself up or, or beat other people up around that. You can also say that's the nature of discovery. You know, We try things and they work or they don't work and we learn. The important part is to view it as a journey. And so you need leaders who have a certain failure tolerance. Now, failures that stem from incompetence or uh, negligence or fraud, and these of course you don't want to reward. But many companies, for example, issue high recognition awards to people at their annual meetings. And the question I always ask is, how many people actually get an award for having tried something that didn't work, but you want to reward the fact that it was attempted? And as Tom Watson said famously, the founder of IBM, if you want to succeed faster, make more mistakes. And so this gets into the question of learning cultures versus performance cultures. On the one hand, you need to learn to get better. You have to sow seeds and not all you know, produce something. And then the ones that do, you have to harvest. But as you create a harvesting culture, what some call the performance culture, you don't want to get to the point where you kill off any innovation. So there is a tension in organizations between learning and performing, and leaders have to balance that. So getting that balance right, which depends a little bit on how volatile your environment is, how strong your competition is. All we know is if you don't embrace failure and learn from it, you're gonna eventually go out of business.
Yeah, so indeed the Mac Center, it tries to be and is, I think, a successful uh, hub for knowledge sharing. And uh, it's also a place, this is what universities do well, where new ideas can be presented, and uh, like at our conference, and not all, all of them have traction, and not all of the research that we fund uh, shows, you know, has, has, um, has good yield. But I think this is inherent in the discovery process. And in today's very uncertain environment, I think in some sense, companies should become more like what we try to do at the Mac Center, which is uh, embrace open innovation, challenge current business models or assumptions, be open to that. And, um, and I think that's one of the things that we try to uh, uh, encourage our industry partners to do. But, you, but I don't think you can do it all by yourself. The world is just too complicated. So you have to think of your business environment as an ecosystem where you have uh, privileged relationships with uh, suppliers and partners and customers and regulators and banks and people who finance you, etc. And the more you can start to view that as a knowledge network from which you tap insights, I think then you will better be able to navigate uncertainty. Okay, so when I, after I wrote uh, Brilliant Mistakes, uh, a book that looks at how to find success on the far side of failure, uh, there were two sort of responses. One is that a lot of people find it a, a very intriguing idea because it seems to be a contradiction, right? That a mistake could, could be brilliant, although the brilliance is about the learning from the mistake, so what happens after the mistake. Um, the other sort of learning I had is that it is quite difficult in companies to get this implemented. This is not just like innovation is a difficult topic. This is an extreme form of innovation. You're trying to innovate by challenging the most deeply held beliefs in corporations. And this can clearly work, and it has been very successful in some companies, but what it requires, that's what I've learned, is really support from the very top. You need leaders or a board of directors that have this uh, mentality that they view a certain number of mistakes are necessary for success. And if that is not calibrated properly at the senior level where people want to eliminate mistakes, if that's the mindset, then this is a very difficult thing too. So it's a cultural problem, I think, at its root.